John and Carol, we, we are uh, just so deeply grateful that you guys are here. And, uh, I mean, these are, these are heroes in, in the faith for us. And, uh, and, you know, I think just even throughout church history, they're heroes. And uh, so we, we are so, so grateful to God to know you guys, but also to have you come and, and just pour, pour out. And I just want to encourage every person here this morning, be ready to receive uh, something from the Lord. Because I, I really do feel what, because you guys sh- shared a little bit of what you're going to be speaking on this morning, like absolutely transformational uh, for our lives. And so just lean in, sit on the edge of your seat. Uh, we are so, so blessed to have them. Can we give them a warm welcome uh, as they come? Uh, love you, Johnny. Uh, oh, it's so good to be back here. We just have had so much fun um, and so many miracles and got so blessed. We walked in last night and it just felt like home. So thank you for loving us. Thank you for your love, um, because it, it, every time we come, we just we feel that incredible love from you guys. So thank you so much, and it's a delight to be here. And we're going to do a team teaching. John's going to start first. But um, yeah, open your hearts. Father, I just ask that you would just come right now, and Lord... Some of these people do not know us, but they know you. And so, Lord, I ask that you would give them a sovereign gift of trust to be able to open their hearts and, Lord, to receive all that you have for them. Wow, because you're such a good, good father. And Jesus, you're such a good savior. And Holy Spirit, you're anxious to set us free to open the doors that have been closed, ah, because, Lord, we have much work to do. Lord, we're in the end times, and, God, you want to use every single person with a powerful anointing. And, Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Whoa, give her more, Lord. That's a great way to start the morning, isn't it? Just the joy of the Lord. Just, just go pull her out. Oh, yeah. How many would like a touch like that just to get you going this morning? Oh, my goodness. Holy Spirit, you know exactly what you want to do in this place today. <laughs> Yeah, we we have to keep saying to ourselves, remember to have fun. Because see that when you go through the list of the fruit of the Spirit, you have love, number one, then joy is number two, isn't it? And so when joy breaks out in the room, it's a good thing. And, uh, you know, we've been at this almost 30 years and 30 years ago, believe it or not, you could not laugh in church like that. They're, people thought it was irreverent and all kinds of stuff. They were offended by that. So just nudge your friend and say, lighten up a little bit and enjoy the presence of the Lord. And take the Holy Spirit on his terms and let him do it his way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and if he wants us just to have a good laugh this morning, that's okay with me. Woof. Lean over to your friend and say, let that joy and fire fall on you. In Jesus' name. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Good for you, sweetie. Just keep going. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's great. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
There you go, Carol, stir them up. More, Lord. More glory. Just ask her what's so funny, just for fun. You know, that laughter hit me one day many years ago, and uh, we were doing a conference in a nearby city called Hamilton, and it was supposed to be a serious conference on healing or something. And uh, it all broke out, you know, just spontaneously as it does. And <laughs> and so at, at, at the end of the night, after just a night of glorious chaos, um, <clears throat> This little gal came up to me. I don't know how old she was, probably about 19 or so. And I remember she was really skinny. And, and she said, I, I think I have a word for you. Can I bring you a word? And I said, sure. And she, she started off in this rhyme. It was almost like a rap. And, and I remember looking at her like, how do you do that? How do you do that? And the next thing you know, I was spiraling down uh, I grabbed a hold of a nearby column and spiraled down to the floor. And Carol's looking at me like this, you know, like, John, what is going on, you know? And uh, it's right after that, that laughter hit me, kind of like you. And I can remember thinking, what are you laughing at? There's absolutely nothing funny. And your mouth is open so wide, and you're just, ha, 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 ha. Yeah, it was, it was, it was great. It was not me, that's for sure. It was the wonderful Holy Spirit just having fun like he loves to do. Oh, yes, yeah, so let's get this set up so it doesn't shut off on me. And we'll get into it. So, I want to talk to you this morning about a very familiar topic to, to Carol and myself and to many of us. That we call, in, in, in a book we did called Grace and Forgiveness, this is one of our oldest books if not, I, I think, the second oldest or so. And, and it's just still selling and selling. And I, I like booklets, by the way. You see how thin that is? Uh, because people actually read them. You know, someone gives you a book, and you're like, thanks, and you get through the first chapter or the, and halfway through the second one, then you get busy, and that's as far as you go many times. But with a booklet, people read them. And uh, we're indebted to people like John Sanford and John and Paula Sanford for, for really bringing a lot of this concept to us. But this is such a pivotal message because we, we all want more power. We all want a breakthrough. How many want a breakthrough today? How many want more power of the Holy Spirit? I mean, we down the list. How many want more love, more joy, more peace, more patience, gentleness, meekness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness? How many know what the final fruit of the Spirit is? Self-control. I'm glad you brought that up. You know, self-control is given so that you can control yourself. But listen carefully, 
It was never given for you to control the Holy Spirit. So when he comes on you and you do things like laugh, you're to let that go and say, God, whatever you want to do to me, in me, through me, I want that. Because that's not you now, that's him doing it through you. Do you see the difference? And so he wants to bring the kingdom through us. And um, there, there's just an unlimited supply. And one of the biggest blockers of grace that I'm aware of is this stuff called unforgiveness. And unforgiveness, it can be a little thing or it can be a big thing. And, and, well, let me ask it this way. Is there anybody here that's never, ever been hurt by another person? <laughs> Just ask him. Never, ever. Okay. So now how do you handle that? How do you process that? And I've seen multitudes of people laugh their way to freedom. And do you just enjoy it, sweetie? Don't be embarrassed by that at all. Just go for it. Because it's always good. But we, we do get hurt, and, um, and we chuck it down, and we try to be brave, and we say it doesn't really matter, and I'm okay, and all that kind of thing. But then there's a judgment gets in behind it. And, and that is exactly what the enemy's hoping to do. So I want us to look at a couple of scriptures here. Um, first one will be Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37. It's one of the favorite scriptures of mine. It says, love the Lord. With all your heart, put your hand on your heart. With all your soul, put your hand on your soul. Maybe. And with all your strength, put your hand on your strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, this trumps everything. If you do this, you've kept the law. You've fulfilled the requirements. And so learning to love is really, really important. And um, the next scripture that we want to go is to is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And uh, this verse says... By grace, you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not works. The gift of God, lest anyone should boast. And there's a real key here. By grace, you've been saved through faith. You know, grace is a word that I've heard all my life. I grew up in the Baptist church, and grace was talked about. I wasn't really sure what it was, except that it was something good. So someone asked you, what is grace? What would you say? What does the word actually mean? God's what? Abiding presence. Abiding presence, okay. The word actually comes from a Greek word, charis, which means a free gift. A free gift to the undeserving. In other words, it's not someone who performed a task and is being paid a wage. That's not a gift, that's a payment, that's a wage. But a, a free gift is something that is given uh, generously to the undeserving because you haven't earned it. 
And by grace, by this free gift, we have been saved through faith, through believing. It's not of ourselves. It's not works. It's a free gift. And herein is the crooks of the matter. Because what Jesus did on the cross is nothing short of phenomenal. Because, well, let me say this. How many of you know God is absolutely perfect in all his ways? How many know that? Is everybody aware that he's perfect? And uh, how many are happy about that? Are you glad he's perfect? Okay, now what are the implications to you and to me? Because we have to deal with the perfect one one day. And he's going to ask you the hard questions. Why were you mean to your wife? Why were you uh, stealing from your employer? Why were you doing all this and that? Because he absolutely cannot and will not tolerate injustice. Do you know why? Because see, if he overlooked it and said, oh, I don't care. You stole, you lied, you cheated, you hurt, you murdered, you killed, you whatever. But I don't care. That would mean he forfeits his perfection. Wouldn't it? And we don't want that, do we? And so here's the dilemma. He's perfect, and he puts that on us, but we're not perfect, so now what are we going to do? So you read the Old Testament, you see all these types and, and symbols and sacrifices and things that went on, trying to get out from under the punishment that is due to us. And then we read John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What does that mean? That his perfect son came and paid my debt and yours so that my debt could be paid in full and perfect justice was satisfied, not by me, but by someone who loved me. And so therefore, I can be debt free, I can be out from under anything I owe to the perfect justice of heaven because of this free gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does that look like? That looks like Imagine the floor where you're sitting on represents a justice level. And at a justice level, you are going to get what you deserve. How many want that? I saw that hand. (laughs) You don't want to get what you deserve, friends. What you want to get is mercy the grace, the free gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I I read the scriptures all my Christian life, and every now and then you hit things that you really unsettling. And one of those for me was the story of Abraham and Isaac. You know, um, Abraham was uh, 99 years old, and Sarah was 89 when the Lord came along and said, you're going to have a son through Sarah, your wife. And they both laughed. You got to be kidding. And, and the Lord says, no, why did you laugh? They called the baby laughter, which is what Isaac means. And they loved him. He was a precious little boy. He grew up, and when he got to be, I don't know, 12 or 13 years old, the Lord came and said, Abraham, I want you to take your son Isaac, who you love, and offer him as a sacrifice unto me. What's going on here? Has that story bothered anyone else besides me? 
You know, the rabbis won't teach that in their yeshiva schools because it seems to be talking about human sacrifice. And what is this? And I'm, I'm like, God, what, what is happening? And you see Abraham getting ready, goes from where they were in Beersheba to three days journey to uh, one of the mountains of Moriah. And I think it was likely the highest peak in that ridge, which is through Jerusalem, which is now we call uh, Mount Calvary. And off they go. How many think he told Sarah what they were doing? No way. <laughs> Honey, we're going camping for a few days and we'll be back, you know. And they're going up the hill together. Isaac has the wood on his back. Abraham has the fire and the knife. And Isaac asked him a question. We have the, we have the wood, we have the fire. Where's the lamb for the sacrifice? God will provide the lamb himself for the sacrifice. And so they go up the hill, they build the altar together, they put the wood on it together, and then Abraham says, all right now, son, climb up on the altar because you're the sacrifice today. And you know what? He, he does it. Isaac could probably have outrun Abraham. He's about... 13, Abraham's 113. But he doesn't. And my question was, God, what is going on? Because what happened was he's about ready to kill his son, and the Lord says, stop. I, I really just wanted to know if you trusted me to the limit. And see, that, doesn't, that didn't help me, because that's like... Is that what you're like? Are you so, you're so cruel that like you would test that poor old man like that? I mean, nobody could do that, could they? So what do you think's going on here? Here's what I concluded that he showed me. God wanted to know, is there a man anywhere who's willing to do what I'm about to do with my son? And I'll tell you, that day 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross, I think it was the saddest day in the Father's heart in all of eternity. And yet, he was willing to look past that through that because he knew that if we go through with this, your sin and mine will be paid and perfect justice will be satisfied. So now we can step into grace. And so we have to conclude justice is good. It's just that grace is better and grace will take you to a higher place. You can step up into grace. And you know, when you get into grace, if something kicks in, the devil can't follow you up here. Because there is no grace for him. His whole domain is the law, like the justice level. And he's the accuser of the brethren. He's always trying to point out how wrong you and I have been because we didn't this or we did that. And what we need to do is stay up into grace and live in grace because you know what? It's in the place of grace that the river flows. This is where the blessing is. The, the power of God does not flow at a justice level, at least not yet. One day, justice will be meted out. And he'll draw a line under all the rebellion and all the sin and all the nonsense that's going on. And that'll be dealt with. But for now, the Spirit of God is only moving in that river of grace. 
And so it becomes therefore very important that we live in grace and not try and pick and choose. I'm going to live at a justice level when it comes to you, but I'm going to live in grace when it comes to me. No, it doesn't work that way. How many want to live in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? Okay. The next scripture is Matthew 18. Matthew 18, verse 21. We have Peter asking a question of Jesus. Lord, how often should I forgive my brother? Peter came to him, said, Lord, how often should, uh, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Now, Peter's being really generous here. He's been hanging around with Jesus, and he says, you know, we operate like three strikes and you're out. Okay, you did that once, and I'll let it go. But now you've done it again. So this is the absolute, okay, third time, you're out, my friend. I want nothing more to do with you. Three strikes, you're out. But Peter's thinking, Jesus will never buy that. So, because he's always telling people, go the extra mile and always be kind and always be thoughtful and always be forgiving. And he's feeding the multitude and he's healing everyone in the meeting and all this kind of thing. He's just letting the river of grace flow. So he says, Lord, what is reasonable? What's the limit here? Seven times? And I could just picture this. Can you? He, Peter's kind of up on his toes and he's like, am I getting it, Lord? Am I getting it? He's expecting a pat on the back. And the Lord says, no, Peter, not seven, but 70 times seven. 490 times, just for starters. And I think because of the look on Peter's face, like the what? look on his face that Jesus told the rest of the story. This is a really good story. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who tried to, who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. That's 10,000 talents of silver, a talent's about 75 or 80 pounds. We're talking $200 million here. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. And so this, this is the hard part for many of us in our culture because we, we we're offended by the legal application of the law when it comes to justice. You say, oh, the poor guy. Oh, he's about to lose everything. Isn't there something that we can do? You know, I, I remember teaching this session in a, in a school in Toronto with leaders, we do a three-week version of our school of ministry there, and I was teaching them this, and for, to illustrate, I wanted to make the point about justice. And so I told them a story, you know, there was a young guy, robbed a bank, and um, <clears throat> he broke into homes, he broke into your home, stole all your stereo, and wrecked all your private wedding pictures and everything else, and, and he robbed the bank, and he did this, and he did that. But the police caught him. It all went to court. The evidence is heard. And the judge said, young man, I find you guilty as charged. And I sentence you to five years in prison, or else you will pay a fine of $200,000. And then I asked the school, 
How many of you agree with the judge? You know, I got about 10% of the class that said, yeah, that's, that's a fair sentence. Everybody else said, no way, the poor kid, like how old does he? I mean, what about, the, you know, his mom? What about this? What about that? And so now all of our sympathies seem to run toward the victim. I think that's or to, to the perpetrator, I should say, and rather than the victim, because I think we, we're a bit under guilt ourselves, perhaps. And I had to keep retelling that story and adding to the seriousness of it. And I finally got to the place where I said, okay, this guy not only stole all that stuff, he raped 15 women, uh, he stabbed and seriously injured most of them, and two of them actually died from what he did. But the judge said, five years in prison or you'll pay a fine of $200,000. And now they're outraged, no way. Throw him in prison forever. And I said, congratulations, you finally got in touch with justice. Because see, justice is getting what you deserve. How many are excited about justice? <laughs> and if you've been a victim, you're happy to see justice served especially on the perpetrator. Now, I read an article about um, when someone was being um, executed in Texas for crimes against humanity. And I, I think they'd raped and murdered and stuff like that. And the family of the girl that was murdered made sure that they were there to witness the execution. And I thought, wow, that's, that's really heavy. But it brought closure for them. Okay, he got what he deserved, and so now may she rest in peace, that kind of a thing. We have to get it into our head that justice is good, and the perfect one is just to the max. It's just that mercy is better. So get that into your spirit. Justice is good, but mercy is better. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the mercy of the Lord. That's why in the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 12, verse 24, the scripture says, the blood of Abel cries better things I'm sorry, the blood of Christ cries better things than the blood of Abel. Because see, Abel, he was crying out for justice. My brother has taken my life, and my life is over. God, do something. But what does the blood of Jesus cry? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Aren't you glad he said that from the cross? Imagine if he said, Father, come and get these murderers and give them what they deserve. Oh, my. But, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So let's read the rest of this story. The servant therefore fell down, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay it all. Well, he's asking for more time, and the master said, you know, more time's not going to do it. The master of that servant moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him of the debt. You know, when the master did that, who actually paid the debt? How many here are in business? You have a business. Wave at me. Okay, have you ever had any bad debts? Wave at me. Have you ever had the accountant say, 
you know, we need to write these off the books. When we had our travel business, our accountant, Dick Green, would come every year and so John, these are bad debts and we need to write them off the books. Doesn't that sound harmless? And uh, I'd say, Dick, we're not writing this off the book. You're talking about $20,000 here. And he'd say, well, you carried it forward for the last two, three years and you're not gonna get it. This guy died, that guy moved away. We don't know where he is. And the other one, you know, whatever. We're writing it off the books. And I knew what he meant was we would absorb the loss. We would take the hit. And this master here, he took the hit, something like $200 million. And when Jesus died on the cross, for you, he took the hit. God paid the debt himself, but the debt got paid. See, I want you to see justice is so important. Well then, this servant went out, found a fellow servant, and uh, said, pay me what you owe me. And the fellow servant fell down to his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me and I'll pay you all. But he would not. But he went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and they came and told the master all that had been done. Okay, so what did that look like? If this platform represents the place of grace, uh, this guy was down on a, on a justice level. And he owed $200 million. And he begged, please have mercy. Don't sell my wife, don't sell my kids. I mean, oh. And the, and the master said, great. You owe nothing, I forgive you, the debt. And he left the place of justice and went to a better place, a higher place called the place of grace. And no doubt they celebrated and said, honey, we're debt free, come on, let's go out for dinner, let's celebrate. But then he remembered his fellow servant and he said, hey, pay me what you owe. And the fellow servant said, I can't right now. So he came down out of the justice, uh, out of the place of grace to a justice level. And it says he grabbed him by the throat and threw him into prison and said, stay there till I get my money. But the, the, the other Christians told the Lord on the guy. And the Lord said, you wicked servant, come here. Now see, this is the only condition that I have found in all of scripture on salvation, okay? I forgave you that mountain of debt because you begged me. Could you not have had mercy on your fellow servant and forgiven him for four or five thousand dollars? And the story goes on to say that they delivered that guy to the torturers until he should pay his entire debt which had been reinstated. And then he says, and this is what my heavenly father will do to you. Point to your friend, say you. Point to yourself and say you. Unless you forgive your brother of their trespasses. Now, is that unreasonable? No, because you see, look at the, 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 the degree that he went to to get us all debt free and into the place of grace. It cost the life of Jesus. Can you imagine the Father's heart when Jesus is praying in the garden of Gethsemane? He says, oh, Father, all things are possible with you. Surely there's another way. Find another way. I don't want to go through this. Nevertheless, not my will, yours be done. 
And the father's saying, son, there is no other way. And you know, it bothers me to no end with people uh, saying that sin doesn't matter anymore, that Jesus paid it, so hey, just doesn't matter how you live now. I mean, it matters very, very much. If you're gonna trample underfoot the blood of Christ, my friend, your debt will be reinstated. And you're gonna get a big surprise on Judgment Day. It's serious, isn't it? That it's so serious that it required the death of the Son of God to get us out of trouble. And we need to treasure that with every, everything in our hearts. Lord Jesus, I thank you for that day that you died on the cross for me. I thank you for that day that Billy Graham preached the gospel and, I, and it fell upon my ears. And my grandfather said to me, if you're not sure, you better go. And man, I ran to the front that day and Christ came into my heart. I, I just love thinking about it. The next day, the grass was greener, the sky was bluer, everybody I met was a wonderful human being. <laughs> I mean, come on. Justice is good, mercy better. James 2.13 tells us that mercy triumphs over judgment. Many years ago, I got to speak in uh, Westminster Chapel when R.T. Kendall was the pastor there. And I spoke on this message. And uh, I remember we went into the vestry after. Do you know what a vestry is? That's where they hang up all their robes and stuff. And there's this lady came begging to see me. And so I said, sure. They brought her in. And here she was, uh, completely deaf, but she was one to the Lord through Louise Kemble's um, ministry to the deaf. And she says, I'm ready to forgive. I said, tell me your story. Well, about five years previous, she was a nurse on her way home from work in London. And at about 11.30 at night, she was grabbed by this guy, dragged into an alley and raped, like viciously raped. And then he took a steel pipe and he tried to kill her with it and essentially broke every bone in her body. And, but she didn't die, she lived. And, um, but it left her deaf. It's beating around the head and everything. She, it's deaf. And, and so she said, I'm ready to forgive. So I led her in a little prayer. Lord, I choose right now to give the guy who did this a gift that he does not deserve, a free gift of my forgiveness. He owes me nothing because Jesus has forgiven me. A little prayer like that. And all of a sudden, this woman started screaming out. And, and, and she's like, oh, 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 oh. And here, all these broken bones that had, had healed wrong and healed crooked, her whole rib cage was straightened out. And just the power came on her. And the Lord just healed her body from all that pain. And R.T. and I, were, we were just in shock about what God did. And I realized myself the power of forgiveness. Because here's the river of God wanting to flow, wanting to flow. But the enemy is saying, no, you don't, because she's blocking this with the bitterness of judgment and hatred and unforgiveness towards this man. And the father said, yeah, he's right. That's, that's how this works. That's what I mean when I say that unforgiveness is a grace blocker. 
it stops the river of God's love and blessing. Forgiveness has to be a gift. Now, if we go over to Matthew 9, we see the Lord's Prayer there that we're all familiar with. Remember the, the Lord's Prayer? I think it's 9, is it? No, 6. Back in the day when I was in high school, I graduated in 1960, but yet every day in high school... Ontario in those days was five years to grade 13. One of the teachers, our homeroom teacher, he'd, he'd get up on a chair and he'd read the Bible. At the end of that, we'd all say the Lord's Prayer. How many said the Lord's Prayer in school? Do they still do that here in Alberta? Make sure you put it back, right? <laughs> But we used to rhyme it off. It was really like, our Father weren't in heaven, hallowed be thy name, King, amen. But you know what? When you stop to read it and see what it's saying, it's got a whole lot of good stuff in here. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Wow, wait a minute, what does that mean? That means, Lord, will you forgive me to the same degree that I forgive others who sin against me. This is very biblical, this stuff. You can call it healing of the heart, which it is, but it's very biblical. Forgive me like I forgive them. Wow. And now there's another component to it. I'm gonna ask Carol to come up and talk for a minute about judgments because her struggle was forgiving her mother for a thousand and one things. And um, I don't know, it took, when we first learned about this, it took us about three years to <laughs> get through it all. Because with my ex-wife, I had vowed that no woman was ever going to hurt me like that again. No way. But what that meant is keep people at a distance. Well, Carol got through my defenses somehow. Because she was so sweet. And I thought, well, maybe there's one. But get in touch with what's hurt you. So go ahead, sweetie. Okay. As John said, I became a Christian, and I learned about forgiveness. And so I was really diligent. I mean, I really got saved. I had the audible voice of the Lord in the bathroom when everything in my life was going wrong. Speak the 23rd Psalm. Anyway, so I was radical. I mean, my whole city said, hmm. Watch out for Carol. She's got religion kind of thing. <laughs> I was not quiet about my faith. But anyway, so I learned about forgiveness, and I really thought, oh, my gosh. I mean, I needed to forgive my mother for, I think it's well, now, I used to say 9,900. I think it's 10,999 things, and I'm not kidding. And so work through it really, really diligently, like I it took me a while, but I got really serious. I really, everything the Lord reminded me of, I forgave her for. And great. Then I looked in the scripture one day, and Matthew eighteen thirty five, If you do not forgive from your head, then your heavenly Father will not forgive you. Doesn't say that, does it? If you do not forgive from your heart, then your heavenly Father will not forgive you. And I thought, oh, oh God, I need you to forgive me. I've done a lot of things wrong, like a lot of things. And Lord, I just really need your forgiveness. 
and I really struggled with that. I thought, well, maybe I really didn't mean it. Maybe I just, you know, said it. So I went through all of it again, and I, mm, I put everything, you know, into this to forgive my mother. But guess what? I still didn't love her in my heart. And I'm thinking, Father, what am I going to do? Like, I need to really get it in my heart to forgive her. And so the Lord, in his graciousness, oh my goodness, took me and blessed John and Paula Sanford. They have saved my life. But if we do not forgive from our heart, then our Heavenly Father will not forgive us. And Satan will know when you have and when you haven't. And if we haven't, that's just like handing him the keys to your house. At some point in time, you will reap something because of that. So bitter root judgments and expectancies are our inner defense mechanism. We use those as a kid growing up before we even know about forgiveness. And we put that solidly in place. Hebrews 12, 15 says, see to it that no one, I don't know whether I'm going to get up there or not, see to it that no one misses whew, the grace of God, Okay, this is the grace. See, too, uh, no one misses the grace of God. I'll get down for the rest of it. <laughs> it's a little, little wiggly. Um, and that no root of bitterness spring up and by it many be defiled. Right? So bitter roots grow when we've been really hurt we begin to form them when we've been hurt again and again. A bitter root, you can really tell in your life, if you remember a situation, a hurt, a pain, um, a wounding, an abuse, just like it happened yesterday, there'll be a bitter root underneath that that is nurturing it, that is keeping it alive. Like you have trees. Do you have Manitoba maples? Do you have a big maple trees here? No. Uh, what kind of trees do you have, big ones? Is it big-leafed oak? Do you have oak? Poplar? Sort of poplar, anyway. Anyway, you all know what a maple tree is, right? So they have big, long branches going way out, and they grow really high. And that's what you see when you look at them, or a spruce tree or whatever. But underneath are this whole system of roots. And those roots, I found out, go right out to the very tip of the last leaf at the end of the branch, or up. So the roots are just huge underneath that tree. Now, why would God do that? Why would, why would he give a tree roots? Support. So if a really bad wind comes along and that tree has really good roots, it's going to be able to go with the wind, right? What else does it give it? Nurture. Same thing. Bitter roots in us do the same thing. They hold us captive. Well, okay. We ain't moving. I'm not forgiving her. I've judged her big time. But you see, the sneaky thing is, you don't know that you've put those roots down. And those bitter roots that are cemented, sort of, with the root system are what the enemy has keys to your life. Bitter roots, listen to this, are probably the most 
powerful negative force in our lives. Let me repeat that. Bitter roots are perhaps the most powerful force in our lives, and they have the power to defile many. Yikes. I tell you, when I found that out, oh my gosh, I realized, oh, not only did I not forgive my mother, but I judged her. You're this and that and that. Now, on the outside of me, you would not have seen that. I was, like, full of fear. I was this girl that, um, you know, just had this plaster cast and stood really still because my mother was, and because of, I mean, I didn't understand it at the time, but my mom uh, was, one time you'd walk in, and she'd be baking cookies, and you're coming home from school. Hi, Mom, how's it going? And she'd go into this rage at you. And, like, it wouldn't make any sense because you didn't do anything. And yet, if you said anything, it got worse. So you just stood there, and you'd take the beating and whatever. Next week or two weeks later, she's cooking, or she's baking cookies again. You walk into the house. Hi, Mom. How are you? Oh, great. Come on. Here's, here's a couple cookies. Here's some milk. Sit down. Like, and she'd be just great. And so you never knew when mm, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, who was coming up, right? It was just like, <gasps> and so I just honked it down. But inside, right? So I didn't outwardly negatively sin against her. I didn't rebel. I didn't do, I did everything I was told. But inside, I hated her. I absolutely hated her. And so when I received this teaching, I thought, oh my gosh, Lord, I have got to get through this. And I began to, again, work. And it took me three and a half years to do the basic getting through them. The Lord said, I don't want you to get overwhelmed. Just do the ones that I tell you to do each day. Work at them every day. And if there's a hundred of them, tell Satan to take a hike because I won't overwhelm you. Okay? It might be all true, but I won't overwhelm you. So I began to work through. So now I'm an adult. I'm a Christian. By this point, my, my mom had had a massive stroke when she was 55 for no reason other than anger. And um, so anyway, I would now try to love her, try to be there. Um, and so I would go and I, I'd give her a hug and I'd tell her I'd loved her and I did to the best I was able to. But about three and a half years into it, it was like I gave her a hug and said, Mom, I love you. And out of my innermost being came this incredible, just incredible freedom of love for my mom. And I thought, Lord, you have healed me. You have set me free. And it was just the most amazing time. Oh. And from then on, I mean, she would do things, but you know what? She was probably, I don't know, 93% or 91% better than she'd ever been. And the odd time that she would have her little whatever, you know, the Holy Spirit would say, you want to go into the grace? Are you going to stay in the justice? Are you going to go into the grace? Are you going to stay in the justice? That? <gasps> no. No justice. I don't want justice for me. I'm coming up into this place of grace. Uh-uh. This is where I want to stay. <laughs> Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm staying up here. And let me tell you, he'll do the same things for you. It just is amazing. Now, 
bitter root judgments um, give, get their power from the unchangeable laws of God. First one is honoring your mother and your father. Um, Johnny, could I have a Kleenex, please? Then I, I meant to bring one up. Sometimes I cry, sometimes I don't. Thank you. <laughs> but now my nose is running. Okay. We can do this. All right. Deuteronomy 5.16. Honor your father and your mother only if they're good Christians and they do everything right. <laughs> don't you wish? Shucks, it doesn't say that. It says, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you. I went, Lord, command? Like, that's a pretty strong word, Lord. Why would you use the word command? Why would you use the word highly recommend or strongly suggest? But command? And the scripture goes on to say, so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You see, in every area where we sow honor to our parents, we will reap honor. But Something's doing something. Where is it? I got oh the no great. I don't know where your stop is here. It's got the start on it, but anyway. But in the areas where we've been hurt, where we've been abused, where we've judged, and then we dishonor, things will not go well with us in the land that the Lord our God is giving us. That is absolutely the way it goes. We taught this um, in Mexico. At the end of the service, uh, a husband and wife came up, and the wife's all crying, and, and the husband's kind of standing behind her like this, and she says to me, I don't even know why I'm saying this to you. She said, but I want to tell you I'm leaving my husband. I'm kind of like, oh, um, what, what, what's going on? She said, he's a pastor, and every week he beats me up, and I've had it up to here. I can't stand it any longer. I'm leaving him. And I looked at the man and I said, sir, tell me what your father was like. And he hung his head again. And he said, my father beat my, my mother every single day I was in that home. I said, sir, that's your problem. You have dishonored your father. Now, no little boy deserves to have his mother beaten up every single day. But the enemy came in, and he hated him, and he judged him, and dishonored him. And the enemy just took that and that unforgiveness and hooked him. So I said, will you pray with me? Can we give your father a gift he, doesn't, he hasn't earned and he doesn't deserve? A gift of your forgiveness. So he said, okay. So we prayed the little prayer. And I said, and then we're going to pray a prayer because you have dishonored and judged your father in hurt and pain and bitterness. And that is your sin. And Satan has you hooked to do the very same thing. So we prayed another little prayer. Lord, I ask you to forgive me for my sin of dishonoring my father and judging him in hurt and pain and bitterness. And I ask, Lord, that you put the cross of Jesus between me and the law of sowing and reaping. Off they went. Uh, three years later, we were in, I think, either Houston or San Antonio. I can't remember. But anyway, this couple comes up to three years later, come up all smiley. Do you remember us? 
I said, um, tell me your story. I was the man that beat my wife. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, I remember you, yeah. And then I said, boy, you sure both look happy. He, she said, yeah, and he hasn't beaten me ever since. He prayed that little prayer. Like, come on. How simple and yet how powerful the enemy has us deceived. And when we make these judgments and when we make these vows, um, he just has um, an absolute heyday. When we judge, we have to reap. It's in the word of God. It's in the laws of God. So let's go to the law of sowing and reaping. Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So what you sow, you will reap. And the same with unforgiveness. Same with judgments. We will reap if we sow negative things. But God wants all of us because he's a God of love. He's a God of blessings. He's a God of forgiveness. He wants us to reap all the good things which are possible in our lives because the Holy Spirit will remind us to come up here, okay? If you let him and give him permission, he will keep you from getting judgmental, from criticizing, from all of those things. And he'll say, do you want in the place of grace or do you want to go down there in the place of justice? The law of becoming what we judge, Romans 2.1, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at every point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment will do the same things. Wow is right. Have you ever caught yourself doing things that you disliked in your mother and your father besides me? Come on, let's be honest. Yeah, we have. That's what happened to the man that beat his wife, the pastor. Judged his father, ended up doing the same thing. One or two little prayers, and he was set free. Come on. How easy is that? So forgiveness is twofold. Okay? If I, used, if I stand straight in front of you, I got a little crooked finger, but anyway, you only see one finger, right? Okay? You know there's two there, but do you get the message? This is what has been done to us. This is the hurt, the pain, the abuse, the beatings, the whatever that has been done to us, sin done to us, for which we need to forgive. But behind that is our own sin of judgment because of hurt and pain and bitterness. And this is the one that hooks you at the wrong time <laughs> to bring you down and to cause you pain. Now, my mom's story, I, one day I was able to tell her what I've told you. I didn't go into my story with her, but... She said, yeah, she's crying. Um, anyway, she worked through all of her mom was controlling. Her mom was angry. They had um, seven kids, and um, six were girls. One, or no, five were girls, two were boys, and they worked on a farm in the Depression. So her mom was out in the fields. So it was hard times. And the 
older siblings had to bring up my mom. Number one, she wasn't wanted as a, as a girl child, if she had to be pregnant, if her mom had to be pregnant, and the, the sisters didn't want to bring up another baby, so they were mean and cruel to her, my aunt told me years later. And so you can see what happened to my mom. So she forgave her mom, she forgave all the people, her sisters, whatever. And, but I was too chicken at that point to um, <laughs> talk to her about me because I had gone to her when I saw this teaching. And she said, I said, Mom, I want to confess my um, sin of dishonoring and judging you. Um, I said, I've, I've got this teaching and I've realized that I've sinned against you. Will you forgive me? Now notice what I said to her. Whose sin did I confess? Confess your own sin when you're asking for forgiveness. Okay? Don't confess their sin. It doesn't work very well. <laughs> anyway, she said to me, stop. I'm too old. Too much has happened. Don't ever mention this to me again. And I was just devastated. And the Lord said to me, Carol, do you want to be healed? I said, yes, Lord, I want to be healed. And he said, then you deal with your junk, which I did. So anyway, a couple days later, after I talked to her about this, all her, you know, her mom, or her sisters, etc., the Holy Spirit would not let me off the hook. <laughs> he kept saying, go tell your mom. Go talk to your mom. Go to your, you know, on and on and on and on and on and on. Okay, okay, all right. I'll go. So anyway, I went to my mom this one day and said, Mom, do you remember a long time ago I came and I asked you to forgive me for my sin of dishonoring you? No. <laughs> and I put my hands on my hip, and I never do this to my mother, ever, right? You don't confront mother ever. Anyway. And I put my hands on my hip, and I said, you do too. <laughs> and, she, and she broke into tears, and she said, Carol, I am so, so sorry. She said, the very thing that was done to me, I've done to you. Will you forgive me? And we got to reconcile and hug and, like, at that point, I was probably, I don't know, 60. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? And uh, so God is in the, in, the, in the process of healing and restoring. How do we open ourselves up? Refusal, refusal not knowing, or an inability to forgive someone causes bitter roots to start to grow in our heart. Memories happen that are fresh, like I said. Look for the bitter root. Once we judge people, then um, it begins. That judgment will hook us into developing um, bitter roots. And bitter roots not brought to the cross must defile. We don't like to hear that, do we? They must defile. Um, trying to do this in two, two sessions in one. Um, so the law of judgment applies, not just to our conscious actions, known or unknown, but performed outwardly, but also what is lodged in our heart repressed, unknown, and unexpressed, where there's unconfessed sin and unforgiveness in our heart, we will reap that bitter root. Hmm. Now, bitter roots are not the terrible things that have been done to us. They're our own sinful reactions, okay? I want you to realize that it is your sin. It's not somebody else's. Yes, somebody else hurt you, and you, you, you didn't forgive them and you judged them. 
but the judgment is our own sin. And um, it's blame shifting. It's a health, it's a self-fulfilling pattern where we push people to fulfill that judgment. So we reap over and over again, not just through the primary person that it happened, but others throughout our life. In my case, it was domineering, controlling women. It was like I had this big sign across my head as a pastor's wife. Okay, all you domineering, controlling women, come on. Just come alongside. And and away we'd go, and it wouldn't be long, and they'd be domineering, controlling, and spitting me out. It happened again and again. And I, I need to tell you, I do have a measure of discernment. But where it came to domineering, controlling women, no, it just wasn't there. And, and my... You know, my judgment, my sign was all women are, are manipulative, right? The, the judgment I made was personal. My mom is manipulative. My expectancy, on the other hand, was that all women would be manipulative. It might be um, something else. Bitter roots uh, grow when you've been hurt over and over and over again because you have a sign across in the spirit realm and you're wondering why do these things happen again and again and again to you. Reoccurring patterns. Um, and primarily it starts with family. Mother, father, sisters, brothers, grandparents. But expectancies happen through people in our lives that we have the sign. Um, Matthew 7, 20, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. And so, we want to pray. We are hardwired to be judgmental. Our ancestors ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So everybody thinks that they understand what's going on. And if you listen into conversations at a restaurant or wherever you are, you, you find people are talking about the injustices that have happened to them. And you hear things like, do you know what she said to me? Do you know what he did to me? And it goes on from there because we're hardwired to be judgmental. But Jesus has come along and given us an out. And the out is this place of grace, the free gift. So how many are in touch with some unforgiveness that you need to you know, deal with? Just unashamedly wave at me. Okay, so not every hand is up. But let, me, let me ask this then in terms of the judgments now. How many of you would like to be exactly like your mother? <laughs> Wave at me. One. Sometimes you get one or two. They got lovely mom. <clears throat> How many would like to be exactly like your father? Wave at me. See, we got another one or two. So now, to the degree that you don't want to be like them, infers and implies that there's probably a judgment there and maybe a hurt in behind it, you see. And these are the things we want to become aware of because um, the enemy knows how to, how to make you know, life miserable for you by pressing on all those buttons. So that's what we want to do today. And we want to go into... Uh, a prayer, because see, it works like this. You can have mercy or you can have justice, but you can't have both. You gotta go one way or the other with this. And please don't choose justice because that means you also get what you deserve. So it's mercy or forget it, right? That's where we gotta go, so. Let's, let's pray. 
Let's all stand. Those of you that want to deal with some things, come on up to the front. It's also giving a message to Satan that you're absolutely uh, committed to being free. Just crunch up. There's going to be a lot behind you. You don't have to kneel if you don't want to, but so I make room for everybody. Yeah. Yay. Yay. Come on. We're going to take the tools. We're going to take the tools away from the enemy today. Yahoo. Yahoo. Keep coming. Come on. Scrunch in. There's a lot behind you. Make room for them. Scrunch in. Yep. Come up along the sides. Come on. There we are. Okay. We're going to deal with both of them. John 20, 23 says, If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So we're going to choose to forgive and then we're going to repent for our sin of judging, okay? Yeah. All right. Heavenly Father, I choose today. Ah, and I thank you today, Lord, that I'm taking the keys away from Satan. And I'm not giving them back. Yo, I choose to forgive my father. I want you to look at him, whether he's passed on or not, you have a memory of him. But I want you to look at him and I want you to say, Dad, I forgive you. I give you a gift that you haven't earned and you don't probably maybe deserve. But I don't deserve to be forgiven either, Jesus. No. So Dad, I forgive you for abandoning me, for abusing me, for preferring my sister and my brother over me. for not protecting me whatever it is I want you to tell the Lord Lord this is what he's done and I'm giving him a gift dad I forgive you for not giving me the love that I needed Dad, I totally release you. And I tear up all the IOUs that you owe me. And I want you to actually physically tear them up. We're tearing it up, Lord. We're not having any more. And we put them down at the foot of the cross. Oh, Jesus, I can't deal with them anymore. And Lord, I repent for my own sin of dishonoring my father. Lord, I ask you to forgive me. I acknowledge that it's my sin. And I ask you to come and to wash me clean. Wow. And, and thank you that you used him to give me life. And Lord, I put the cross of Jesus because Jesus paid for my freedom. 
So I put that cross and what you did, Jesus, against the law of sowing and reaping. Lord, I don't want to reap any more from men. Mom, I want you to look at her. I choose to give you a gift that you haven't earned and you probably don't deserve. But Lord, I didn't either. And you forgave me. I forgive you for not protecting me when my father was abusing me. For being manipulative and controlling. For having rages of anger. <sighs> for not being there for me when I needed you. <sighs> and whatever else the Lord's bringing to you. I forgive you, Mom. You owe me nothing. And I tear up that I owe you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient for me. And I put that list at the foot of the cross. Wow. Mom, you owe me nothing. I let it all go. And I ask, Lord, that you would forgive me for my sin because I hated her, Lord. Wow. And I judged her, Lord. Lord, and that's my sin. And I asked you that you would totally wash me. Clean. Oh, ah. Uh, I turn away from all that bitterness and judgment. Mm, and I put the cross between me and the law of sowing and reading. Wow. Now we're going to go through others that may have, so we're just going to not name them off. There's other ones, please put it in. Lord, I ask that you would um, forgive me for judging my sisters and my brothers, my grandparents, my uncles, my aunts, my teachers in school, my peers in school, my ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriends, and, and or ex-husband, ex-wife, my neighbors, my employers, my pastor, or pastors, those church people. Uh, <laughs> anyone that has hurt me, Lord, I give them a gift that they haven't earned and don't deserve. I let them go free to the foot of the cross. Oh, and I tear up the IOU and I give it to Jesus at the cross. And Lord, where I've judged them in hurt and pain and bitterness, Lord, I confess that is my own sin. And Lord, I ask you to forgive me. Whoa. 
because I do not want to reap anymore. And Lord, I choose to break my agreement and I renounce all the bitter roots that I have planted as a result of my judgments. In Jesus' name, I break the power of the judgment and the power to hold this root in place to harm myself and others. In Jesus' name, I break the power behind all the bitter roots and the bitter root expectancies from myself. And I place the cross of Jesus between me and the consequences of this judgment or judgment and judgments. Lord, I bring these old practices and patterns and you can name them of judging, of criticizing, of fault finding, of whatever it is. To death now by the power of your cross. And I declare an end to the law of sowing and reaping in my life. Whoa. And Lord, I ask now that you would come and restore trust to my heart. You just breathe that in for a minute. Breathe all the mistrust out. I lift off distrust, mistrust. Wow. Off of your hearts right now. It goes in Jesus' name. Off it goes. Off, 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 off. Just breathe it out. Just breathe it out. Breathe it out. And Lord, I breathe in a gift of sovereign trust. Just begin to breathe that in. I breathe in that gift of trust. Your trust, Jesus. Lord, I trust in you. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I take authority right now over every generational sin on my mother's side all the way down to the 10th generation. Ah, I put the cross of Jesus between me and my generational line on my mother's side. And Lord, I do the same for my father's side. I renounce and I break every generational curse and sin that has come down my line. Whoa. And I take it to the cross. Oh, and I free my gen me from my generational line. Lord, I cut them free. I cut them free. I cut them free. In Jesus' name, I sever every curse and every, ah, oh, whoa, ungodly thing from your generational line. I free you because of the blood of Jesus. Wow. Every curse comes off of your line. All of it, all of it, all of witchcraft, all witchcraft, occult, sexual sin, off it comes. 
off it comes now in Jesus name violent controlling sins off they come right now off out out they go whoa out they go all of them all of them whoa the blood of Jesus what he's done on the cross has set you free from every witchcraft from every sexual sin from every controlling sin every violent sin uh, every negative sin off it goes in Jesus mighty name right now one ma'am look at me one look at me off it goes honey look at me out it goes one two three all of it all of it all of it goes in Jesus name thank you Lord and father I just bless wow the godly inheritance that has come down your line because even though some of it has been bad there's been godly stuff that you have not accepted and I call every godly good thing on your mother's line and on your father's line back down into you oh and I bless it in Jesus name I bless the godly inheritance that's coming down your line and I breathe life into that I bring destiny into that in your life Wow where the enemies come in and caused it to be negative I cause it now to revert and to be godly inheritance embrace the good embrace the good thank you Lord and Lord now we want to take those signs that we've got over our heads like reject me like control me like abuse me don't notice me uh, hurt me control me manipulate me abuse me um, ignore me take it off and stamp on it yo ha uh, now we got those signs off yep all right let's ask Holy Spirit will you show me my new name will you tell me my new name beloved chosen princess champion whatever it is victorious ah, whatever it is well thank you Lord thank you Lord oh yeah the big antidote to all of this is the love of God we need to get filled up with this stuff called love I don't know, give somebody near you a big hug and uh, just let it flow. <clears throat> Tell them I'm not an orphan anymore. I have a heavenly daddy who loves me. And that's with all due respect to those who are actually orphans, unfortunately, but all of us act like spiritual orphans. But friends, listen, there's many threads to this message. Um, there's much follow on. Um, I don't know what we were thinking. We never brought any books with us, but 
the, the one, the message you heard today is essentially this book, Grace and Forgiveness. So you can order it from our website or you can order it from Amazon, um, johnandcarol.org or Amazon and get that book. But this is a pivotal foundational message that we need to get into our hearts and start living because by it, because you take away the keys from the enemy and you find that life will go better. It never goes perfect. You know, there's always stuff, but it's nice to disempower the enemy, isn't it? And say, when you live in grace, you can look at him and go, ha, 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 you can't get me here. Because he cannot. And so he tries to pull you down out of grace back to a justice level and get you demanding your rights and wanting what you feel you're entitled to and holding on to all that stuff. And uh, just kiss it all goodbye and live in grace. That's our, our best course. But there's a whole lot of ramifications that now come your way. One of them is physical healing that comes, I don't know, 10 times easier once you get the barriers of unforgiveness and judgments out of the way. And so we're going to break for lunch and, and then we're coming back with a, a tremendous session this afternoon. And then Carol and I will be back tonight. <clears throat> and uh, I think tonight we're going to be talking about the revival that is certainly coming. And <clears throat> God wants to use you. And it'll be a lot easier if you leave your brokenness behind and become a dread champion in the anointing. So have a nice lunch, won't you? And uh, we'll see you at 2 o'clock, I believe it is. Mm -hmm.